Welcome back to the Get Unstuck and On Target podcast. I'm Mike O'Neill with Bench Builders, and we love helping leaders sleep better because they've solved their tough people problems. In this podcast, we're talking with experts to get their insights on ways to help you or your business get unstuck. Joining me today is Brandon Wilson. Brandon is the CEO of Wilburn Inc. It was founded in 2006. Wilburn started off as a higher education think tank, providing communication counsel to more than 100 college presidents. Since, Wilburn services have expanded to include public relations, brand management, and creative services. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on the show. What I did not say in my introduction, Brandon, is that Brandon is a survivor of leadership sabotage. And it's in his new book, Sabotage, Brandon shares his bout with betrayal, theft, and deceit that cost him nearly $700,000 and threatened his livelihood. Goodness gracious, I know you had rather not had that experience that led to the book, but you've just published this book, correct? That's correct. That's correct. So this is this is fresh. And before we get to your book, can I just go back a little bit to your to your company? You shared a little bit about the name of your company before we started recording here. Wilburn, that is a kind of a mashup of two names. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a, it's a family name, Wilson and Brown family. And, you know, I never I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, I worked in sales early, early in my career, and I, I wasn't very good at it <laughs> at all. And uh, I had a chance to work as a student in student affairs, and I worked closely with the university's president at Auburn University, the late Bill Walker, and mm. learned a lot about leadership there, learned a lot about, about execution. And from there, I went on to work at a civil rights organization that does incredible work uh, fighting against injustices and empowering others to do it. I had a chance to work really closely with the founder there. So my life has been really impacted by great mentors. And one time we were traveling and we were in Penn, at Penn State. And I remember in the hotel, we were just talking. He said, Brandon, you, you, you're, you're pretty good at what you do. You, you have an instinct about you that really helps you um, to pinpoint the things that leaders need. And you, you got a, at a pretty young age. I was in my 20s then. Mm -hmm. And he encouraged me to start my own company. And, and never before had I felt so flattered being fired. <laughs> 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 no, he wasn't firing me, but I, I, I did tell him, if you want to fire me, just tell me to leave. You don't have to flatter me out the door. But he kept saying over and over again, you know, start something, do, do your own thing, I, I, you know. And I, and I would just sort of shrug it off. But the thing that really changed the, the conversation for me was when he said that, told me the story about why he founded the civil rights organization that he founded. Mm -hmm. And he said he found it in order to shape the world and, and to create a better world for the people that he loved. And he said, Brandon, if you are not interested in being an entrepreneur, at least be interested enough in it to build something to benefit those you love. And so... I took it to heart and I immediately the next day went online and reserved the name Wilbron, which is the Wilson Brown portions of my of my family that my, my mom married into and, and the rest is history. You know, you have as your mission statement, your company's mission statement, probably one of the best mission statements I've read in a long time. It's two words for good. That's it. <laughs> Powerful. Thank you. Thank you. How does your company operate for good for your clients? For good is it informs every decision we make. We have at our company um, what we call a three-way test. Rotary has a four-way test. They, that they do. I am a Rotarian. I believe in putting service above self. And we have a four-way test in, in Rotary. At Wilbur, we have a three-way test. Uh, and the three-way test at our company that informs everything that we do is one, is it good for business? Hmm. What that means is, is it, does it promote ethical business practices, solid and sound and responsible business practices? The second is, is does it positively impact community? 
and you know make sure, making sure that it does that and then the third is is does it positively impact the life of the ordinary person hmm. and if the answer is not yes to all three of those questions then we we, we don't pursue the opportunity or we choose a path that allows it to be yes and so that that is our definition of for good something that is good for business good for community but also good for the ordinary person and it is it is the way we do business and it is it has been a powerful rubric or compass for us in making sure that we avoid mission creep as we build this engine to shape the world for for the better you know one of the most interesting things i want to share about uh, about that is is that it is our mission, but it also gives us a chance to challenge those who want to work with us. You know, they may call us and say, hey, I want you to help me sell more widgets or do A, B, C, and D. Uh, and we always say, listen, it has to, in order for us to partner and for us to unlock the benefit of, of, of our incredible talent at our company, you know, we need to make sure that we're not just selling widgets, but we're doing it in a way that promotes ethical business in a way that makes our community or communities better and in a way that propels ordinary people forward. And, and, and that's, that's always a great conversation to have with people because it changes and challenges all at the same time. And so that's our, that's our mission and that's how we utilize it every single day to shape the world that, that, that's, that, that we, as we like to see it. I appreciate you sharing that. You've also mentioned that you had an early mentor who kind of kind of pushed you out of the nest a little bit that led to your entrepreneurial journey. But it sounds as if, based on your experience, you've learned some really valuable lessons along the way. And I would introduce yourself as a survivor of leadership sabotage. So as a starting point, how do you define leadership sabotage? Mike, there's an easy definition and, and it's easy but it's also elusive. You know, mm. I am amazed at how pervasive leadership sabotage is, yet how few people know what it is. If you if you were to ask 10 people this to, you know, what to define what sabotage is or leadership sabotage, I'm not a bed man, but I would wager to think that that many of them will struggle to string together the words to aptly describe it. And mm. so what it is, is, is willful activity. It's okay. willful activity that seeks to obstruct or disrupt someone for personal or selfish gain. Hmm. And, and not just the people, it, it disrupts processes. It's, it disrupts systems. It disrupts uh, organizational missions, all for selfish gain. And, and it looks like, you know, and we've seen it too. It looks like employee defiance. You know, I am a manager. Uh, I am charged with getting, moving the ball from A to, to Y or to A to G. And all in between, I need, I need employees to sort of work with me. And then you have people who resist you getting from A to G. That's sabotage. And uh, there are all types of defiance from passive aggressive, from avoidance defiers to aggressive defiers. And we need to know how to deal with that and see defiance as an act of sabotage. A lot of people don't even see it as an mm. act of sabotage, but they're literally trying to disrupt or obstruct progress in order to preserve something for themselves. And sometimes that something for themselves is familiarity, the comfort they have in the mundane, the comfort they have in the mastery of the skills that they have developed to this moment. And they don't want to push or stretch themselves. And you may be taking them or asking them to go somewhere that's unfamiliar to them. And so instead of me saying no, because you're my supervisor, I'll just sabotage your efforts to slow down progress, to frustrate the systems. There's revenge. Corporate revenge is something that happens a lot. And, and, and not just in corporations, but also revenge in, in our relationship, in our personal lives as well. Reputation assassination, credibility assassination theft. And so when we start talking about it, I'm sure your listeners, all our leaders are saying, man, I, you know, I had something like that happen, or I know somebody who, who, who faced that. And most leaders are ill-equipped with the tools needed 
to address those things when they when they happen. And as a result, you just got to lean on sheer instincts to get through it. And and if you, you know, choose wrong or you don't survive, you, you position those saboteurs to literally rob the world of the impact of your leadership. You know, you've defined sabotage in, in a way that we need that kind of breadth in form of a, of a definition. Why don't we start with the leaders who are listening in right now. How do you suggest that leaders need to be, what do they need to be looking for in terms of potential signs of leadership sabotage? Yeah. How, can they be, how can they avoid it before it actually strikes? That, that's the purpose of the book is, is yeah, we, it's important to overcome, but man, wouldn't it be great to have the tools needed to, to avoid it all together? <laughs> And so, you know, the book Sabotage, Leadership That Overcomes Betrayal, Theft, and Deceit provides leaders with those tools. And, and what I call, what, what I refer to uh, is uh, the signs as the four horsemen of sabotage. Okay. Uh, and these horsemen are things that everybody can recognize. Everybody can see in, in and around their lives. And whenever you see these signs happening, or whenever you see these horsemen ride into your life, you know that sabotage is about to, is not far behind. Mm. The, for, the first horseman to look for is jealousy. Interesting. Uh, that, that's the first one. And okay. we know what jealousy looks like, but there are levels, levels to jealousy as well that my studies have, 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 uh, have taught me and and that my book discloses. But on a very entry level, jealousy, whenever you see someone with a, with a penchant for diminishing the gains of others, it doesn't even mm. necessarily have to be about you, what mm -hmm. you're experiencing, but you hear them say things like, why does Sally always get that? Yes. Why are you always asking Bill to do this? Mm -hmm. what, they, what they're showing you is a propensity to be jealous. Okay. And if unchecked, it can become rooted into to, to give way to activity that becomes actual action for taking things away from Sally or Bill, whether they be opportunities, whether they be whatever, in order to exercise their jealousy. The, gotcha. the other the other horseman is arrogance. Mm. Um, and arrogance needs no introduction because it introduces itself. <laughs> these these uh, this horseman. Um, is fueled by a certain kind of activity or sabotaging activity. But we know the arrogant type, you know, they are reluctant to, to new knowledge, uh, to new training. If you, if you're at a company, they, they, why am I going through this workshop? Like, why do I need professional development? They're also, the arrogant is also incredibly, despite what they may appear to be like, they also incredibly they, they lack self-awareness hmm. so they are uh, in situational awareness so they are unaware of the damage that they might be doing so this the saying you know they really just couldn't help themselves hmm. is is meant for the arrogant leader i mean they're just taken away by winning by being on top and achieving and to getting to that destination d despite who might be harmed along the way the other horsemen are the liars. It's, it's called lying as the horsemen. And, and there are different levels of lying. You know, there are people who lie just to distract from self. Don't look at me. Don't see me so I can continue to do what I've been doing. And then there is another level of liars who lie to harm others. Like mm -hmm. literally throwing people under the proverbial bus mm -hmm. and with an incredible disregard for the harm that they do in order to preserve whatever it is that they're trying to protect within themselves. And then the last horseman is seduction. You know, folks may think of seduction as a as a intimate thing, but it's but it's not. It, we're talking very platonic. They have well manicured personas. These folks have well manicured reputations and they guard them uh, persistently. And they're very intentional about and their ambitious, their ambitions and their desires and their pursuits. And we all have that. But what makes them cross over into the line of seducers 
is that they are they enjoy inviting you along their pursuits to do greater and bigger things even though some of their ways or their means might be unethical uh, and they really don't enjoy doing the unethical or things that skirt the lines of, of this is the right way to do it. They really enjoy getting you to come along that ride with them. That's mm -hmm. what they really enjoy. And they don't believe that the means justify the ends. They, they you know, whatever means necessary, we're going to get here. And boy, is it going to be fun. <laughs> mm. Come along with me. And so those are the four horsemen of sabotage. And if you can recognize those horsemen when they come into your, your life or your leadership journey, then you know what activities you need to be protecting yourself against. So you've shared that there are at least four signs. You characterize them as the four horsemen, jealousy, arrogance, lying, and seduction. And you're encouraging us as leaders, if you see one or more of those then you could very well be subject to potential sabotage. You know, in my intro, I, I shared what you share in more detail in your book, whereas you experienced the sabotage that led to significant loss. And in your book, you describe how does one survive such a sabotage. Could you just offer maybe just some a, a tidbit of the kinds of things that if, if you miss these signs, you're saying that these things are survivable, but if you pick up on these signs, you avoid it in the, in the first place. But if this happens, what are some survival tips that you are offering? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And I want to ask, I want to answer in, in, with three, with three movements to this symphony. Now, okay. The first is my personal story. You know, you know, we should we should be seeking guidance from people who have been places that they either don't want you to go mm. or that they want you to go so they can give you advice and, and and you know i've helped a lot of leaders a lot of ceos a lot of executives uh, unlock mixed levels of impact and to do incredible things um and to respond to crises mm. nothing taught me about the behavior of sabotage more than being one of its victims yes uh, and or survivors mm. uh, you know, years ago, around 2013 or so, 2012, my business was doing really, really good and uh, really well. And my wife and I, we sat down, it was going so well that that we talked about our strategy for the future. We said we would have a child and we would move you know, so we can go to, we have access to the school district that we wanted for the child and build our dream home and all of these things. And I also shared with her that my plans for growth would be to buy companies. You know, yep. we were making some money, so why don't we buy other companies? I got a phone call from a from a friend of mine. Who said, "Hey, I, there's a guy who wants to sell his business. You know, we, we had a mutual friend, mm -hmm. and that mutual friend is going to put together this deal because you know this guy is interested in selling his business. I'll put you all together and have an introduction. puts puts us together." I was, I liked the business. I liked the person, but more so I liked the opportunity it presented. You know, if I were to purchase that business and that, and that book of business, I mean, we would be incredibly wealthy almost instantly. I mean, it was a huge opportunity. And I saw, I saw the lights. I, I saw green day <laughs> lights before I got off the bus, Mike. I said, <laughs> I hadn't caught a pass, but I scored 50, I scored 21 points in that game. Already. <laughs> I hadn't even gotten off the bus. And so we, we got together and I think he saw the glitter in my eyes. He said, man, I got a sucker. And uh, he used that to create and the relationship as a mentor, a mentee kind of relationship, he had, he had done business in that in our industry for a long time. So I was also buying history, mm. uh, but that mentor mentee relationship was uneven. Mm. And, but I thought I could endure it because you listen, we're going to go through the due diligence and we're going to buy the business. Well, I guess the advice of counsel, one of the things that, that I, that I did for fear of not stopping the train from moving was I established with him a third entity where we would start moving all of our assets into this third entity so that I could acquire the assets without the debt, you know, yes. just an asset sale. 
my lawyer said it's not uncommon, but don't do it yet. They said, don't mm-hmm. do it yet. And I said, ah, I got to keep this train moving. I'm going to do it. So I started putting my assets into this third party, into this third company, putting it in there, putting it in there, putting it in there. I merged my staff together while I was doing due diligence still and uh, all at the encouragement of, of, of my saboteur. And about two years, a year and a half later, I get a call from my lawyer and say, you idiot, mm-hmm. come to my office immediately. I go meet with my attorneys and he pulls up. He says, where is your money? He pulls up the computer and does a check in the state registry and the, that company doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. Where is your money going? <sighs> it is a tough story to tell, especially because of what happens next. My saboteur was a bully. Um, mm. and was driven by arrogance. Arrogance was one of those horsemen that he rode on. And you know, I go and confront him and I say, hey, we're going to separate this. and I'm not giving any more money to this thing. And, and I, I remember he looked at me with with the glare of intimidation I've never seen before. And he mm. said, he said, you know, if you don't want to give me any more of your money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill your wife. Wow. That's what he said. And he said, and this is how I'm going to do it. He said, I'm going to call my buddies who work for the police department, who work for the DA's office, and I'm going to get all these trumped up charges against you. And I'm going to make you spend a whole bunch of money. But I'm not interested in the money. I'm not interested in because you got my money. You can pay for it, is what he said. <laughs> what I'm interested in is getting a mugshot so that mm. you can be seen as a criminal everywhere you go and your wife is not going to be able to survive or mm. to, to to knowing that she's married to a crook mm. that's what i'm going to do and he did it <laughs> he tried to do it and my instincts my resources allowed me to fight back and and i survived now seven hundred thousand dollars later nearly seven hundred thousand dollars later but that expense is was it's what I charged I charged that expense to gaining the knowledge needed to now share with other leaders so that they can avoid those signs of sabotage. The second thing I want to say in answering that question is is that avoiding leadership sabotage is so incredibly important as a matter of wisdom, as yeah. a leadership discipline. It has nothing to do with paranoia. And the reason why I challenge you to change your thinking if you if any audience member is thinking about it in that way, is to change that thinking is because what you are pursuing as a leader and the more effective you become as a leader in pursuing those things, the more consequential your leadership becomes. Literally changing the world or access to food for those who might have food insecurity, changing public transit systems for those who might be dependent upon transit, getting more better education to underserved communities. I mean, really consequential things. And if you allow yourself to be tripped up by sabotage, then you allow yourself to have the gifts of the benefits of your leadership taken away from those folks that you're trying to serve. And so the to the spirit of your question, if you, if you are ever faced with sabotage, and you will be, and it's around everywhere you go, one of the most powerful things you can do is two things. One is to lead with character. Character is a potent and powerful weapon against sabotage. And then the other is, is to have a strong and and to curate and nurture a strong, positive self-identity. And that'll help you stop the self-sabotage that you may be inflicting on your own self. Could we go down that path a little bit? And that is, you want to have a positive self identity, but you just introduced the word self-sabotage for the first time. For our viewers and listeners, how can we self-sabotage knowingly or unknowingly? Oh my goodness. Listen, some of the, some of the, the best thieves have our hands. (laughs) You know, we steal from ourselves and, you know, every, every one of those horsemen, if you want to find them, Sometimes all you have to do is look within, Mm. just look within. And, you know, a study of sabotage is not complete without turning the mirror inward also. Mm. And that's why character and self-identity is so important. Positive self-identity is so important because it allows you to really become so self-aware 
that you understand the things that uh, that may have you become jealous and it may lead you to become a liar what are you trying to hide what are you trying so understanding those things will help you root out the forces that may lead you to be a self saboteur that may take you know start taking things away from yourself uh, i have a great story about that that i'll keep really brief there is a in 2014 i had an idea of creating a company that would allow neighborhood kids and moms to go shopping for other people and they would deliver the groceries to your door can you mm. believe it in 2014 <laughs> i had that idea i wrote a business plan i thought it was great i was like man this is amazing let's do this I interviewed a consultancy a research firm to see what people's appetite would be for such a grocery delivery service and she said brandon i have another client who who's interested in doing something similar but I'm telling you, man, he, he's been telling me all the struggles that he's having. He said, it's tough. It's difficult. Are you sure you want to do that? Mm. And I said, uh, uh yeah, <laughs> I do. I go home and talk to my wife about it. She said, Brandon, you got a lot of irons in the fire already. I don't know if you need to take this on as well. I go talk to my attorneys. I go talk to people. It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I started talking to myself. Mike, I said, what do I know about technology? Like, what do I know about the the grocery industry uh, and i gave up on I, I gave up on it and and what drove me was this idea of creating a platform that would allow moms to shop for other moms and across town from where i live there was a guy named bill smith who was a high school dropout family of entrepreneurs and he started the company same company that i had hmm. a job doing and uh, he built it he drew it he saw himself as a as a winner as a successful businessman where I saw myself as one that's being very fragile and vulnerable. And he sold that company for 700, I mean, for $500,000 to target. It's called Shipped. And, and you know, <laughs> and many of you listening probably know that company, but what made a sort of a twist of the dagger of, of me stealing that opportunity for myself, the, the twist of the dagger came when I was at a meeting and the CEO, president and CEO and chairman of Target spoke at a, at a meeting it was a private meeting and he said the reason he bought shipped was because he thought it was revolutionary mm. that someone would create a platform to allow moms to shop for other moms can I'll you be. believe it yes <laughs> <laughs> so we steal from our we sabotage ourselves as well and so this is why you know the study of sabotage is so incredibly important not just because you can navigate the world around you, but it also helps you to become in tune in navigating the opportunities for yourself that's in front of you. Hmm. You know, Brandon, I think you've already alluded to this more than once, but in keeping with the theme of this podcast, can you reflect on a circumstance where perhaps you or a client got stuck? And what did it take to get either yourself or this client unstuck? Yeah, there is a, a great example of that. The story, one of the most pronounced is it's not really, I guess it is stuck. The first was a big idea to do something really uh, world changing. Hmm. And, and it was a bit out of, out of their comfort zone, but not much. I hosted some executives from Apple at my office. And I remember while working with them, we, we helped to establish and stand up and announce a really powerful organization that's committed to using technology to transform the classroom and mm -hmm. transform the way that students and or learners engage with educators and powerful mission. And we stood it up and Tim Cook was scheduled to come down and to announce the, the launching of this new company called the Education Farm, the Education Farm. In preparation for that, these Apple executives were in town and they were buzzing about what to do next, like what's next. But we were stuck on mm -hmm. using technology to transform the classroom. And in a meeting, we had to first confront what we were stuck to. That's the first step. And so we met and, and said, listen, me and Tim Cook is going to be down here. We're going to talk about using technology to transform the classroom. So. We're stuck to that idea because it hadn't happened yet. You, you know, whenever some, you know, somebody comes out with a movie or a movie comes out, to, if we can go to it, it's already been filmed two years earlier, right? So we, right. we had already planned on Tim Cook coming down. We knew when it was gonna happen and, and we were still stuck to that. 
But we had to move beyond that present. And I remember them asking, so what do you think is going to be next? And us engaging in discussion. And it was not in a disrespectful way. It was a lot of comfort in that conversation. A lot of the same things that we already seen or we were already going to do in the immediate future. And I remember them looking at me and saying, what do you think about those ideas? And I remember saying that, that, that it's not enough. Hmm. It was not enough. So the second thing is to, to challenge the present. So th- to get unstuck, say, okay, we're stuck to this. This is where we are in the present. And then state a future and articulate a future with so much clarity and urgency uh, because and you create the urgency by, by communicating a future that shapes the world that we undeniably want to be a part of. And they said, well, if you don't think that that's enough, what do we need to do? And I remember stating to them that what we need to solve the challenges that we're after is not a camp, not a coding camp or technology camp. What we need to do is to build a campus Hmm. to build an entire college campus that serves as an engine for for developing 21st century leaders who are equipped with the technology to go out and change the world we were immediately were unstuck Hmm. (laughs) and the next question was is brandon how do we do that and then we led to all Obviously, my answer was, is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just got the idea. <laughs> I just got the idea. But we got unstuck. And so to get unstuck, you have to first be very candid in communicating and identifying what you're stuck to. And then identify what things are in our presence that makes us comfortable. And then challenge all of those things and tie it to a vision that we undeniably want to be a part of in order to create urgency that propel us, that move us to action. Brandon, I'm sure you've already used this, but as I was listening, you tell that story about getting stuck on the notion of camp is that your encouragement was is to get unstuck. You had to add an element and you had to involve them. You had to basically say, we, us, so you, another mashup, camp and us just became campus. <laughs> That's correct. I never used that, but I will. Just like right. run, just like. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it, it's yours. Run with that. You know, Brandon, as you kind of think back on the things that we've covered in our time together, what do you want to be some closing thoughts or takeaways for our listeners? You know, it's actually something that I that I hadn't that we hadn't touched on. And that okay. is, is the acme of leadership. You know, a lot of people think about, hey, I want to be a leader. I want to do legacy defining things. I want to do all, you know, I, I believe the acme of leadership is unlocking the power of collective impact. In order to unlock the power of collective impact, to get others to join in your vision, to join in your pursuits, you will undoubtedly also be inviting difference of opinions. You're going to be also inviting people who view life through different lenses. You're also going to be inviting people who have different methodologies for approaching problem solving. And But I think it's important to invite all of those differences into you in order to unlock collective impact, because together we can do incredible things, more so than we can do on our own. But this is why our sabotage the book is so important because you have to understand how to navigate in a world where people may view situations may view the world through different lenses may bring with them different uh, ethical compasses you, you need to understand how to navigate in that world while also protecting what you're after in order to do the transformative things because we need each other to do big things, we need all of those people working collectively together in order to get after those things. And if a leader is not equipped with what they need to navigate all of those differences, then they will fail to have the equipment needed to really protect their large and transformational pursuit. And so 
I think that sabotage is the first early step for getting you that portion of your leadership di discipline so that you can not only know the value of working hard and being resilient and showing up on time and doing what you say, but now you will acquire the skills needed to understand how to be comfortable in disagreement, how to navigate in the midst of disagreement, and how to navigate in a world where people may uh, and very likely uh, want to uh, deceive, betray, and even steal from you in order to, to preserve their own selfish pursuits. Brandy, you've given us an, an incredible preview of your recently published book. We're going to be including links to how to get that book and, and read in much more detail what you've kind of shared with us today. If folks want to reach out and connect with you online, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can go to brandonwilson.co. That's brandonwilson.co, brandonwilson.co. And you can learn about me. You can purchase the book there. You can follow all of my social media handles at brandonwilson.co. But you can also do something else, Mike, that I think What's is that? You can also re reserve 15 minutes of time with me. Okay. And if there are leadership challenges, questions, curiosities that your, that your listeners have, they can just go to brandonwilson.co, get 15 minutes with me, share with share what those insights are, and, and I will unlock not nearly 20 years of executive consultancy experience and, and provide it to them to help them get unstuck and to get on target. I appreciate that offer. We will, of course, include that link in the show notes so people know that they can access you directly as well. I was interested in having you as a podcast guest for several reasons, but the main reason, if I might, would be is that you are marrying up real world experience to include the setbacks. And you've been able to put in language that I was able to understand how we as leaders need to be ever mindful of the role that sabotage can play in our businesses but also potentially in our own personal lives. And so this has been a, a great opportunity just to kind of tease what one would read in the book. So thank you for willingness to, to be my guest. This has been a real treat. Oh, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I also want to thank our listeners for joining us for this episode of Get Unstuck and On Target. Every Thursday, we upload the latest episode to all the major platforms. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. You know, life really is too short to let business problems keep you up at night. So if you've been listening to my conversation with Brandon and you're realizing that something is keeping your business stuck, let's talk. You can go to our website, bench-builders.com, to schedule a quick call. So I want to thank you for joining us, and I hope you've picked up on some tips that help you get unstuck and on target. Until next time. <music>